This lecture is brought to you by the virtual campus of the Reformed Baptist Seminary. For information on other courses or seminary programs, please contact us at virtual.seminary.org. I very much appreciate the invitation to come uh, and to speak. This material was originally prepared for another setting. Uh, it has to do with our church's journey in the work of evangelism. Uh, it's a bit old. I hope that God will give it some fresh wind and fire. Uh, some of it is dated. I'm not sure what to call it. It's not a sermon. It doesn't rise to the level of a lecture. Uh, call it what you will. Uh, I'm not sure what it is, but um, I, I have mixed emotions in bringing the material. Uh, there, is, uh, there is an element of gladness, and then there's an element of embarrassment. It would be something like someone asking you to describe your prayer life. On one hand, you're glad you have one. On the other hand, you're embarrassed that it's not substantially better than it is. And that's what I feel. I'm thankful to report that by the grace of God, some efforts have been made at local evangelism. I'm embarrassed that uh, more has not been attempted, and I'm particularly burdened, uh, embarrassed is probably not the right word, but I'm particularly burdened that we have not seen more people come to Christ. We're still waiting, and we're still hoping, and we're still praying for the harvest. Well, all that being said, recognizing that every good work that we attempt originates with Christ. He gives us the will, and then he supplies the energy and strength to attempt it. I'm certainly willing to testify to what Christ has moved us to attempt for his glory and for the salvation of others. Please understand, I'm talking about what our church has attempted, not what the pastors have done, certainly not what this pastor has done. This has been the effort of the church. At the same time, as I say that, I would not want anyone to think for a millisecond that I'm presenting our church as a paradigm of anything. <laughs> We are not. We are plotters. Uh, that's probably the best way to describe us. We're plotters. Um, we're stubborn to an extent. We keep trying things. But we're not models. And I would not have you think that we are. I've organized my remarks under three headings. At the risk of boring you, I, my first heading is the biblical impetus for our efforts. Uh, I know you know this material quite well, but we have to begin there. We should begin there. Secondly, an overview of the efforts that we have made, at least the ones I can remember. And then finally, hopefully, some practical lessons derived from these efforts. First, the biblical impetus for our efforts at local evangelism. In a broad theological sense, we all continue to live under the creation mandate to exercise dominion in and over the earth for God's pleasure. Under the new covenant, the major thrust of that exercise is to capture the nations for Christ by means of the gospel. To capture the nations. That's how I believe that we, under the new covenant, exercise the creation mandate. To capture the nations for Christ by means of the gospel. 
And the Lord Jesus gave us that mandate in those familiar words that we refer to as the Great Commission. In Matthew 28, 18 through 20, Christ came and spoke to his disciples saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore, going therefore, make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. Such are the triumphs, the conquests belonging to our resurrected Redeemer, that he, the incarnate Lord, claims all authority over heaven, over earth. In that authority, he sends his apostles, and through his apostles, he sends his church to go throughout the nations, making disciples unto him, incorporating them into his kingdom as that kingdom is expressed in and by the church. And of course, we must ever be clear that making disciples happens only through the communication of the gospel. Luke 24, 47. The church may, I think the church must, do many things in order to communicate the gospel. We'll talk a little bit about that. Many things that we must do in order to communicate the gospel, but those things will not make disciples. Only the gospel is efficient to make disciples by the blessing of the Holy Spirit. Now, in the book of Acts, Christ demonstrated his power and his willingness to conquer, and that's really what we're talking about, to conquer considerable segments of pagan cities and to do so relatively quickly by the proclamation of the gospel. In a relatively short time, there were very mighty strongholds of Satan where he had invested centuries of efforts to inoculate people against the glory of God. And rather quickly, the gospel preached by ordinary men, some of them less than ordinary perhaps, And those bastions of satanic dominion fell. And hundreds, even thousands of people came to Christ. How do you explain that? It didn't happen under Christ's ministry. It happened under his apostles' ministry. How do you explain that? That's the work of the reigning Christ. He's exercising the authority that he gained by his cross and by his resurrection and by his ascension. Now, has Christ lost that authority? Has he lost the will to do that kind of thing still? I'm not just talking about saving people. I'm talking about saving lots of people quickly. Does he still do that? We're somewhat invested in the Far East. And we're somewhat amazed at how much has been accomplished rather quickly in the Far East. People converted out of sheer darkness, formed into churches, even confessional churches. Here it takes, it seems like, a lifetime. There it's taken about a decade. Christ is still powerful. And he's still willing. But he has his own sovereign timetable for what he purposes to accomplish in every place where he sends the gospel and where he establishes his church. And that timetable is not the same for every place. Furthermore, the timetable hasn't been revealed 
to us. Nevertheless, this must be a controlling element in our self-conscious awareness and purpose as churches. When we define what we're about, this must come close to the top. We are called to be outward. We are called to extend the kingdom of Christ by means of the gospel, commencing where we are and working outward. The word go in the Great Commission could be translated traveling. Traveling. Well, we don't like to travel. I don't like to travel. But that's what we're called to do. Churches are to travel. They are to be moving outward with the gospel for the purpose of making disciples. Now, I think perhaps in Mebane, uh, our history has been one more of launching over the seas before we began in Jerusalem. Uh, we, we jumped over Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria, and we, we aimed at the uttermost parts of the earth first. Uh, that's not the way it's supposed to be done. Thankfully, God has called us back to consider the needs of our Jerusalem. My dear friends, not a prophet, but I'll play one for a moment. Bad things happen to churches, and bad things happen to Christians. Whenever, for whatever reason, they cease being Christian imperialists, in their praying, in their desiring, and in their efforts. When, when churches stop being purposefully evangelistic, when Christians stop being purposefully evangelistic, at least in prayer, bad things happen to them. Early in my ministry, I had an old man, an old pastor, Tell me, and I'll never forget this. I've forgotten most things, but I remember this one. He said, I'm not trying to gain any more people. Just trying to hold on to the ones I have. To my knowledge, that church no longer exists. wonder why. But how do we carry out this kingdom-building labor in a society that is increasingly drugged by materialism, hedonism, secularism? How do we overcome an escalating hostility to Christianity joined to an openness to almost everything that's non-Christian? That's our present culture. Our culture is drugged. Our culture hates Christianity. Our culture has a love affair with almost everything that's a non-Christian. So how do we do kingdom work here now? Well, first of all, should we suppose that the opposition that we are facing is greater than the opposition encountered in the first century church? Think not. See, what we're becoming, they had been for centuries. Pluralism, hedonism. Think there was any of that in the Roman Empire of the first century. We're headed toward what they had been for a long time. And it was in that context that the gospel enjoyed such monumental success. But we need help in learning how to operate out of a position of distinct weakness as opposed to a position of perceived strength. My earliest memories of evangelistic effort occurred in my early teens when people from my home church would go to downtown Winston-Salem to hand out gospel tracts. 
uh, as a very shy 13-year-old, that was, that was like having wisdom teeth cut out, to walk up to sheer strangers here. I, 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 I just don't know how I can read, you know. But, you know, the experience was not so painful because of the people. It was painful because of my shyness. By and large, by and large, people would smile and accept it, thank you, and walk around the corner before they threw it away. There would be a few who would be ornery, but most were pleasant and receptive. We were treated with a measure of respect. In the earlier years of my pastoral ministry, uh, it was assumed that if you invited friends and neighbors to church services, they would not view that as an intrusion upon their own independent integrity and free thinkers. What do you mean, trying to force your religion on me? Nobody thought like that. They thought you were doing them a favor. Maybe they didn't want to come, but often they would come, at least once. And when people got into trouble, I'm not talking about financial trouble, I'm talking about troubled marriages, troubled young people, they would often come to the church and they would say, would you pray for us? Would you help us? And so we operated, I operated for the greater part of my life in ministry from a position of perceived strength in that Christianity was widely respected as true religion. It was assumed if an American, particularly a Southern American, was going to be religious, he was going to be a Christian. Well, that has substantially changed. And in some parts of our own nation, it has changed radically. One of the largest challenges that we face is that of gaining a hearing for the gospel. Gaining a hearing for the gospel. We are operating from a position of distinct weakness in terms of popular culture. The popular perception the preconceived notions concerning who we are, what we are about, are increasingly hostile. It's evident in the media, and whatever comes across the media, the average Joe out there is drinking in. He's imbibing it. I was on a sports message board just this week, and a thread caught my eye. Is there a place for evangelical Christians in the marketplace of ideas? That's weird for a sports message board. Well, what was particularly challenging were the responses. Some people said no. Some people said if they hold that a century-old book is absolute truth, there's no place for them in modern dialogue. I don't think that that way of thinking is peculiarly exceptional. That's a world in which we live. It is a different day. We cannot assume that the unconverted are going to come to us. And if we make our primary evangelistic thrust to be the Sunday morning sermon, we're going to be like the pastor who put on all his fishing gear took his fishing pole and started to the second floor of his house. And his wife said, where in the world are you going? I'm going bass fishing. Where? In the bathtub. If we think that we're going to do evangelism primarily in our Sunday morning preaching, our Sunday morning service, we will be like the guy fishing for bass in his bathtub. So what do we do? How do we do evangelism today? Well, the answer, I believe, is that we very much need to return to the beginning. It's not something new we need, something old. We need to sit humbly, thoughtfully at the feet of Christ, at the feet of his disciples. 
You see, part of our Lord's earliest call to those men who became the pillars of the church was this, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. Now, perhaps, in all probability included in that, is that as a result of following me, you will become mighty spirit anointed preachers. They did become that. But Christ's promise also implied that by watching him, following him, watching him, studying his way with people, they would learn how to reach people who would be either ambivalent or even hostile to their message. That's what Christ did. He reached people who were either ambivalent, didn't know who he was, didn't particularly care, or had been conditioned by their religious teachers to be hostile toward his message. Now, what did Christ teach his disciples, and what did he teach us by his example? He taught us that people are one to a hearing of the gospel. And that's what we're talking about, gaining a hearing for the gospel. People are one to a hearing of the gospel by love and by loving efforts to meet their felt need. When the hungry are fed and the naked are clothed and the mourning are comforted and the oppressed are relieved, when the fearful are given hope, when the lonely are befriended, when hurting people are loved, they're much more inclined to allow us to speak to them about their relationship to the God whose love we have just ministered to them. When they have a self-conscious recognition, those people really care for me. They really care for me. I, I'm skeptical but they keep at it. They keep feeding, clothing. They keep trying to comfort me. They show interest and they stay at it. I think they really do care. I don't understand it. And I ask, why do you care? And they say, because God loves us. God loves us. God wants us to love you. We are loving you with the love that we received. And we would really like to be able to introduce you to the God who's given us this love that we've given to you. If we keep loving them, I think it is probable that at least at some point they will allow us to tell them about this God. So elementary. It's also intimidating. The first step toward winning the perishing in an antagonistic culture is by loving them, not changing them so we can love them comfortably, but loving them where they are. Loving them in such ways, not in such a ways that we go home and say, I did something loving, but loving them in such a way that they felt loved. Now, that's not the mantra of a weak, man-centered theology. That's the heart of genuine Christianity. Turn to 1 Peter 2. 1 Peter 2. 11 and 12. Beloved, I beg you, as sojourners and pilgrims, travelers, Goers, I beg you, as sojourners and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lust which war against the soul, having your conduct honorable among the Gentiles, so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may, by your good works which they observe, glorify God in the day of visitation, we're God's special people through the grace of God in Christ. We glorify God by abstaining from sin 
and by performing good works. But what kind of good works? Not just righteous works. Not just being truthful and working hard and treating our wives well and treating our buddy's wife well. But also by morally beautiful works. Works that benefit people. Even if they don't know anything about the gospel and even if they are never converted they partake of morally beautiful works from us which testify to them of the goodness and generosity of our Heavenly Father. And they will stand in the last day, and if they do not confess Jesus as Lord prior to that day, in the midst of confessing his lordship on that day, they will also confess that they have seen something of the goodness and glory of God. Where did they see it? They saw it in his people who loved them and lived godly lives and were benevolent and generous before them. As we have opportunity, let us do good to all. That's our calling. And that's essential in being kingdom builders. Now, I, I want to give a warning. We must not view loving people as a mere evangelistic technique. It's not a part of a five-step program. We must love people because God loves people, and we're called to glorify God. And whether those people ever love him and ever love us, we're to love them to show them his greatness and goodness by loving people in very earthy ways. We please God, but under his kindness, we may also gain a hearing for the gospel, whereby we do the greatest possible good for their souls. Another elementary principle of evangelism to be learned from Christ and from his disciples is that we must be responsive to the culture in which we live. We must be responsive to the culture in which people live that we want to reach with the gospel. Without indulging cultural sins, without accommodating our doctrine to the skepticism of culture, we must adapt. And you know the text, and I'm not even going to take time to read it. It's 1 Corinthians 9, 19 through 23. I really would like to read it because it's so important, but I think my time is, is getting away quickly. I'll leave it with you to read that. And just remember how uncomfortable it was for Paul to be as one without law to eat a diet he had never eaten in his life. Perhaps to wear clothes he had never worn in his life that he thought beneath him. But he put on, I believe, different kinds of clothes when he was walking through different kinds of neighborhoods intentionally. He ate different kinds of food. He probably even listened to some different kinds of music when he went in to various people's homes. Now, he never saw it his conscience. He never committed sin. He understood that he was bound by grace to righteousness in Christ. But he did things that were personally uncomfortable for him to be where the people were. I'm sure you've preached about that. You've heard a lot about that. I won't say more except to give an illustration of how this works. There are large elements of our culture that have a very keen attraction to coffee. They're drugged. They're druggies. But it's a legal drug, coffee. To me, it's like medicine. But for a lot of people, it's, it's, it's like something wonderful. And they're drawn to coffee shops. They spend hours in coffee shops. Well, I've heard of a Christian couple 
uh, runs a coffee shop for the intention of evangelism. Now, first of all, they serve good coffee. Not the kind of coffee that only a Christian would like. Because <laughs> Christians don't complain. Christians are thankful for all things. You serve them anything, they won't complain. But they serve the kind of coffee that pagans who do complain and aren't grateful like. Good coffee. They provided attractive Christian literature. And most of all, the people themselves, the proprietors, were engaging, warm, friendly people. You come into their coffee shop, and you will be warmly received and encouraged. And they engage people in conversation. And those who go on in conversation, they invite to small group Bible studies if they want to come. And they've reached a lot of people. And people have been converted. These are some of the leading principles that have supplied the impetus to our evangelistic efforts. Now, secondly, an overview of some of the efforts we have made. Divide these into a couple of uh, divisions. One time were occasional efforts. First, door-to-door visitation. At one time, we had a pastor, Pastor Fordner, who was fully supported to do the work of a coal porter. Yeah, I'm really that old. (laughs) Coal porters, people don't even know who they are. He went door to door to virtually every home in our county, making Christian literature available at very inexpensive prices, and some of it free. He put book racks and truck stops and drug stores and grocery stores. And people bought Christian books in that door-to-door ministry and off bookshelves. And people actually came to church. Not so very long ago, teams of men in our church went door-to-door in the communities around our church. I think it's sad, but I think it's typical of our day, those kind of visits are no longer so welcome. They may be more hurtful than helpful in the present time, but we tried that. For 25 to 30 years, our church sponsored, paid for, a column in one of our local papers. It was kind of like a blog in a newspaper. One of our pastors would write on relevant subjects, things happening in the community or in national news, but the main thrust was evangelistic. We had people come to the church for years as a result of that. Uh, One of the things that surprised me the most, I I had a pastor come to me in a small pastor's meeting. He said, I became a Calvinist reading those articles in the newspaper. Really? Wow. Wow. For several years, our church sponsored a booth at Mebbin's Spring Festival called the Dogwood Festival. We just set up a booth, gave away a literature, endeavored to engage folk in conversation. One spring, we rented a, a building in downtown Mebbin close to our booth, and we showed films uh, on creation and, and on the influence of Christianity on American history and People would come and just go in and sit down and watch a film. And I actually think we're going to do something like that again this spring. On one occasion, and I'm not, please understand, when I talk about these endeavors, I'm simply sharing what we've tried. Were they all successful? No. Some of them were colossal failures, like this one. We had a block party. We had a block party for people living in close proximity to our bill. We have people living all around us. So we had a block party. We provided outdoor games for the kids and inflatables, free food, free literature, and a free concert. And we brought in the Red Mountain Band, and they are very good. And they performed, and two or three people came. Our own people have had musical concerts and invited in the community. The most successful was a patriotic concert honoring uh, war veterans. A local VFW was invited 
and came. Uh, every branch of the armed forces was represented. The mayor came. Uh, members of the town council came. It was really a, a very touching event to see those World War II vets. On the first anniversary of 9-11, the churches in our town, we're a typical small town, we got the three mainline denominational church, First Baptist, Methodist, Presbyterian, and then the rest of us. And the main churches in town decided that they would have a memorial. And local leaders came, civil leaders, mayor came, the high school band was there. And surprise of all surprises, they invited one of our pastors to speak on that occasion. I'm still blown away by that, but I think it was because they had witnessed the involvement of our church in the local community. And they concluded that we had people who really did care for the community, so they asked. We once sponsored a free one-day basketball camp for the youth of Mevin and surrounding communities, and we particularly targeted disadvantaged children, boys without dads or girls without dads. We brought in a player from Wake Forest who was an outspoken Christian. He gave his testimony and gave a one-day clinic, and we got the local high school to open up the gym. We had 60 to 70 young men who came. That was before Wake Forest gave up basketball. One year, we offered a $500 scholarship to the best essay on Pilgrim's Progress submitted by a graduating senior in the local public school. For some time, one of our pastors, who happens to be present, was heavily invested in campus ministry at the University of North Carolina in Chapel Hill. He went on campus, established an office, and began just reaching out to people, having small group Bible studies for men and women and meeting with students one-on-one. -on -one. And I believe Stu continues to hear from some of those students occasionally. That was a, a wearisome effort for him. It was not all that we had hoped God would make it to be. But we tried. We have a lot of universities in our neck of the woods, and we feel a burden to do what we can to reach them. In conjunction with Campus Crusade, that's right, Campus Crusade, our church sponsored at least three special lectures at UNC. We had a lecture on creation by Dr. Kurt Wise, we had a lecture on the Da Vinci Code by a former UNC student who is now a professor at RTS. And then more recently, we had a seminar on intelligent design uh, by Dr. Andy McIntosh from the University of Leeds. We've tried to reach various strata of our community, including the intellectuals. We once held a conference on creation, bringing together some of the leading scholars in creation science. We rented the largest facility in Mebane. We made a special appeal to high school science teachers and students to come. Not sure how many come, came, but a lot of homeschoolers came. <laughs> Several young couples in our church have given themselves really in very sacrificial ways to build relationships with government-sponsored government house, housing projects, families that are broken apart. One of the most moving things I ever heard from one of our families was reaching out to this family, <clears throat> mother, several kids, one of the kids visiting in the home of one of our parents looked at a picture. It was a picture of her family. It was husband, wife, children. And she looked at the picture and said, who's that? Well, that's, that's my day. It's, it's my wife's 
to my mommy's husband. And the little girl said, what's her husband? She didn't even know. It's costly labor. A couple weeks ago, a young lady who was befriended by several families during that episode of ministry, who walked away from the gospel, walked away from us, and now has several kids of her own. She's in a really bad way. She came back to church. Her response was, I really did need this. Now, why did she come? Why did she come to our church? Because she had been loved by people in our church. Will she be converted? God knows. In 2007, people who live in the same geographical area went together and sponsored home Bible studies. We had 10 home Bible studies that ran for four weeks, concentrating on the third chapter of John's Gospel. For about 15 years, we sponsored the Reformed Baptist uh, Family Conference in the Southeast. And we did that for church fellowship. We also did that for our own young people. And we have parents now in our church who were converted when they were teenagers at that family conference. We've concentrated on two things in these kind of efforts. Compassion and confrontation. Both. Compassion and confrontation. Now let me just mention, what, when do I finish, Bob? I don't know when I started. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> Things we're doing on a weekly basis. Every Saturday morning, there are men who go to the county jail to preach, Pastor Fortner goes. We have a man who's fluent in Spanish who goes. Occasionally, we have women who go to speak to women prisoners. We have a man in our church who is a member who was converted while he was in jail. We're heavily engaged in trying to reach an extended care facility. Elderly people live. Stu is the chaplain, the official chaplain of that facility. Pastor Fortner goes, they make weekly visits among the residents, they hold Bible studies, they hold memorial services for families of elderly folk who have died. In addition to this, three times a month, three Sundays a month, people from our church go and lead worship in that same facility. We have weekly ESL classes, we have people reaching out to a predominantly Hispanic uh, uh, trailer community, um, playing soccer with kids, holding Bible studies with the kids, holding studies with the women. Many of those women have come to a women's ministry that we have at church. On a monthly basis, folk from our church assist a ministry to international students at Duke University. A uh, real opportunity for evangelizing the nations. They don't always have to travel to the other side of the world. Some of those people are coming to us. And there's a, a large international uh, community at virtually every major university. And in this instance, there is a ministry to them. We've plugged into that ministry. And one of our families particularly are zealous for this, and they've invited people into their homes and this past year, they went to China, and they were invited into the homes of some of the students that they had extended hospitality to when they were students at Duke, and some of them have been converted. And you have to understand, these are not just ordinary Chinese folk. They're doctors. They're lawyers. They're very accomplished people. Probably the most successful single effort that we have undertaken is what is called the Mom's Coffee Connection. It's a service to mothers in our community. It happens the second Friday of each month. It's conducted entirely by women in our congregation. The pastors are asked to approve speakers and topics, but we have nothing to do with it unless they ask us to come and speak. 
It's all done by our women. Um, the average attendance has probably been around 30 with around 60 to 70 children brought. About a dozen women from other churches come. But the most astounding thing to me, this ministry's been going for over seven years. To my knowledge, there's been one meeting in seven years that did not have a first-time visitor. You think about all those meetings, each meeting, first-time visitors. Uh, they had a meeting last Friday. It was, it was a smaller meeting. Um, I think there were 24. But there were three women who had never been there before. And after the meeting, one of the young mothers with two young kids invited all the women to come to her house for lunch. She had 12 who actually came. And the three women who were there for the first time all went. That's exciting. But how much work does that require? <laughs> how much work planning, taking care of the children, setting up the meeting place, taking it down, name tags, keeping up with every woman who comes, following up with every... How much work do you think that takes? It takes a lot. On a quarterly basis, our church sponsors a very nice breakfast for all the elderly members of our community. And they are fed well. Our young people um, host them and usher them in. Sometimes they go pick them up and meet them at the door and escort them in and wait on them. And we sing to them, we preach to them. These people will soon be in eternity, but they're hearing the gospel. We used to have 50, 60. The last few have had over 100. My, lady, my wife bumped into a lady in the grocery store, and she recognized her from one of the breakfasts. And she said, oh, you go to my church. And that's really funny. The lady's never been to our church except for the breakfast. <laughs> and it's become her church. Of course, we do the ordinary uh, VBS, um, particularly reaching out to communities, uh, particularly under, uh, low income communities. Last year, we started another ministry. It's called Action, it's a men's ministry, advancing Christ teaching in our neighborhood. Uh, we meet monthly. Uh, the purpose first is to build greater connectedness with our men, get men out of their comfort zones, get them talking to each other about spiritual things, feeling accountability and responsibility for each other. But the larger hope is that we will mobilize those men to do works of benevolence throughout the community, but ultimately to do the work of the gospel in the community. We've shown films. Everybody's shown films. We intend to show Courageous again this spring. That's a strong film. So many more things need to be done. These are a few of the things that we've tried. Wish I could say we have hundreds of people who have been converted. We have people coming to church who hadn't come before. We have at least one prisoner who's been converted. And I think there are others. It's just not in the hundreds that we had hoped for. Practical lessons. Five practical lessons. I, I'll call these goals for pastors. Number one, piety. If we're going to do uh, evangelism, we have to be a pious people. To be effective instruments in God's hands, we must be genuinely holy people. We must be an earnest and enthusiastic God lovers. That's something we put on, take off. It must be who we are. We must be people animated by a genuine love for God, shown by the way we walk in His commandments without complaining. It's no burden to do what's right in God's eyes. We love the gospel. It, it, it's not something that's harnessed upon us that we just have to do. It's some, we love the gospel. We love to talk about the one who loved us and gave himself for us. 
We pray. We pray for supernatural blessing. I think that's what it, that's what it means to be pious. Secondly, we must be purposeful. We must aim at evangelism. It must not be something that we stumble into accidentally. We must purpose to be evangelistic. And in that regard, we must be purposefully grounded in gospel doctrine and in apologetics. And we must aim for converts. I think, I may be wrong, because I live in a real remote place, but I think there's an element in the resurged uh, reform movement that is slipping toward decisionism in the name of evangelism. Getting people to say yes to some questions about Jesus is not making disciples. Repentance is still part of the gospel. The issue is still sin. The issue is who is your Lord? Who do you serve? And until people freely stop serving sin and begin serving Christ, they're not disciples. And so we have to purpose to make disciples, not simply to get some friends. Thirdly, perseverance. Sincere love for God ought to produce jealousy that God be loved and God be worshipped by all mankind. And so long as there are people around us who don't know him, don't love him, don't worship him, we must be engaged in concerted efforts to show them his glory, hopefully to persuade them that he is God. He's the only being deserving of their supreme devotion. And as long as there are people like that out there, we have to be at the work of evangelism. This is what we're about. This is what we're about. Showing the glory of God, yes, but persuading men of the glory of God. Fourthly, patience. We want fruit. (laughs) We want converts. We yearn for people to actually embrace Christ and follow him. We've got to believe that's going to happen. Why? Because that's a purpose for which he sent us into the world. He sent us to go make disciples. Now, he knew we couldn't do it without him. But when he sent us to do that, there is the implicit promise, I'm with you to make that happen. You go do what you're supposed to do. I'll do what I'm supposed to do. We keep at it lovingly, believingly, prayerfully, people will be converted. Even if they're not converted under our particular efforts, and here's here's part of the mystery. We have seen people converted that weren't necessarily the results of any of these particular efforts. We just received seven young people in church membership Sunday night. Uh, well, which one of these ministries were they the fruit of? None. Well, maybe one. You you see, God called us to be evangelists. He called us to make disciples. He makes disciples whenever he pleases. If we're aiming to make disciples, I believe Christ will give us disciples. Now, he may give them to us in such a way that we won't be able to say, see what we did. We were firing guns over there, and God was bringing disciples from over here. Remember I talked about our efforts in university ministry, what Stu did at Chapel Hill, and what we're doing at Duke. You know what God did? Just, what, three, four years ago, he brought two young women to one of our worship services. We didn't know who who they were. They were from Elon University, which is the only other university in our county, about 20 minutes away. They were part of a campus ministry called Campus Outreach. I had never heard of Campus Outreach. I had no idea who they were. 
Somebody told me afterwards, did you see those two young girls? Yeah. They were taking notes like crazy. They were even taking notes in the pastoral prayer. <laughs> I've never seen anything like it. I never had either. Stu uh, invited them over to his house for lunch. Well, we didn't know. I don't know if you're familiar with Campus Outreach. I know Ted is. Campus Outreach really does aim to be church-based, and one of their functions is to have a church connected to each campus ministry. And they were looking for a local church. And they had had one, but they were not satisfied with that arrangement. They were looking for a church. We didn't even know they existed. And we are now their campus church. And they have had um, anywhere from 20 to 30 kids present on Sunday. And strange enough, a number of them have joined our church. And they've changed the flavor of so much of what we do. Now, you, you get this. We're aiming at Chapel Hill. God's given us Elon. <laughs> That's the point. We engage in the work that he called us to do. He gives the fruit whenever and however he pleases. The last P, participation. This is not a ministry for pastors. I'm not saying we shouldn't be evangelists. I'm saying this kind of thing can't happen without the church. And for far too long in my pastoral ministry, somehow I got this idea, if it's done, the pastors have got to do it. Or the pastors have to be right in the middle of everything. That's not true. And we're supposed to be training the church so they can exercise their gifts without us. And the kind of ministries that we have outlined could not happen unless God's people are mobilized. Now, that's still a challenge because people get excited and then they get unexcited and the ministry continues to fall on a few. And we have to keep rallying the troops so that the few aren't crushed by the burden. But God will help us do that. They're real Christians. That's what leaders do. They stir up the people under their charge and give them a vision and send them out. But that's a major key. Evangelism is a work of the church. If we want people to get really excited about Christ, get really excited about their Bible, they're really excited about being holy. We need to get them excited about this call to advance the kingdom of Christ in their generation, in their Jerusalem. Well, may God move us, help us, keep us from becoming weary and doing what is good.